We're back. We're here at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm here with Jeff Kelly. This is Dave Vellante. David Clark is here. Uh, he's a senior research scientist at uh, MIT, uh, inventor of TCPIP or the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Welcome to theCUBE. And thank you for having me. AI is making a comeback. I'm, I'm thrilled well, to see you. Well, you know, know. <laughs> it's, uh, our lab is computer science and AI, but no, AI, it, it, it never went away. I, well, you know, I mean, I guess not, but not, for, not in your world, but you know, in our world where we talk to a lot of, uh, go to a lot of events and in the big data world, it's coming back with a, with a storm oh, yeah. in the analytics space. I mean, people are actually beginning to make money off of AI. So that, AI, maybe that's what's true. AI is whatever we don't know how to do yet. Yeah, as soon as you learn how to do it, it spins off as its own discipline. They used to do vision, but now that's just called vision. Okay, so, so they have it's monetized like, it's, AI. It's like philosophy. <laughs> it's whatever we don't know how to do yet. Right. Right. But that's not what I do. I do networking. Right, so, uh, well, anyway, we were talking, you were the you were one of the cousins uh, or, or, or grandparents of uh, TCP IP. But, uh, yeah, one of, that's yeah, right, right, one of. So uh, that we were just talking about off camera, what an amazing uh, journey that has been. Um, and you said you were gonna have a bumper sticker, this is not a test. So did you foresee the, the massive potential of TCP IP, you and your team? Well, you know, in the 1970s, we thought we were going to hook every computer in the world together, but we thought there were going to be 100,000. And the thing that really shook us up was the personal computer, because when that happened, all of a sudden, we had this expletive deleted moment <laughs> where we realized we weren't hooking up hundreds of thousands of computers, we were hooking up hundreds of millions of computers. And if you look at what we did during the 1980s, it was all about scale. We had to redo the routing to make it scale. We had to redo the the domain names to make them scale. We had to redo the standards organization to make it scale. And so the real, the real, the real shocker was when we realized every person in the world could have a computer. And now, of course, the last time, every time I've estimated how big the internet is going to be, I undershoot. So the last time somebody asked me, I said a trillion devices. Yeah, that's probably about right. That's probably about <laughs> right. You know, that's only about 100 per person. So what but, the but redoing things to make it scale, that's not trivial. I mean, in fact, oh. there, there are very few examples in this industry of successfully redoing things to make them scale. Usually something else replaces it and disrupts it. That's right, that's right. And we've lived through a whole bunch of orders of magnitude of scale here. So we were, I think, both lucky and in some respects you, clever. You got it right. Yeah, <laughs> not that we exactly knew what we were doing back in 1975, <laughs> but you know. Gut instinct goes a long way, I guess, with uh, with smart people. So we're here at uh, this cyber politics international relations conference. Uh, pretty eye opening. I call it a conference. It's really a workshop. About a hundred folks here. Um, we heard uh, this morning when we sat in the sessions about this sort of gap between s the development in cyberspace and the ability of international relations to, to keep up, and that has a lot of ramifications. Of uh, uh, future of the internet, uh, the adjudication mechanisms. But what are your thoughts on what you've heard today? And maybe you could summarize uh, the, the day for us. Well, the one of the framings of this conference was internet security and the governance gap. And and I think what we were getting at with that title was that security is one of the major issues that's going to shape the future of the internet. Are we going to have a network that breaks into parts? Are we going to have a network that greatly restricts what you can do? A lot of the security problems we have today, we have known about for a long time, we've been addressing for a long time, but there's nobody in charge, and that's probably a good thing most of the time. And so the question is, what does it take to make some of these problems, to, to mitigate some of these problems? and what are the organizations that can do it? If you look at the organizations that are actively dealing with security today, many of them are groups of 100 people that need each other because they trust each other and they, they don't scale because they're built on trust. Large state organizations like the ITU can say, look, we represent the, the collective sovereignty of the states, but it's not clear that that organization understands how to get down and dirty when it comes to dealing with specific security problems. So I asked a challenge today, I said, for several of the specific security issues that people identified, cyber crime or espionage, name me the active organizations that claim I am playing a leadership role and, and I believe I have both competence and legitimacy to be resolving these problems, and the answer is a big silence arises. And so one of the things you could say is, well, we, a lot of the attention today is about ICANN. What does ICANN do about the future of the internet? Two things, addresses, that's really critical, because we ain't got enough. 
and the other is they, they manage domain names. But okay, they just created a whole bunch of new top-level domain names. Here's a really simple question. Five years from now, will the internet be materially different if they did or did not create those names? No. Okay. So what's really important, okay, and who's dealing with it? And that, to me, is what the gap is about. So one of the reasons we're really excited to be here is John Furrier, my partner and often co-host of the, of the Cubes out in Silicon Valley. When he created Silicon Angle, he, he created the, the tagline, where computer science meets social science. So we're thrilled to be at, a, at an event like this where it's just not all about the, the technology. Um, it's about that type of, of, of intersection. So can computer science successfully coexist with, with social science? Well, yes, but each has to learn how to speak the other guy's language. And this has been a five-year project, and I think we spent the first year, or maybe a year and a half, just learning how to talk. Now, I, my roots are sort of geeky here, and so if you ask me to explain the internet, I might, if I wasn't paying attention, begin by saying the word layers, okay? <laughs> and when you're dealing with policymakers, layers don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> unless you can explain to them why they do. Stacks are pancakes. <laughs> That's right. And so you have to find a, a way of taking the structure of the internet and not, oh, let me lovingly tell you about all the layers. You have to do something different, which is, let me tell you the things that matter to you. Where are the points where we are contending over control? And just telling you the internet is layered doesn't help you bring out the points of control. So. We know what we fight over, right? We fight over addresses, we fight over names. We fight over other things, too. Uh, you know, we fight over who controls the software in your computer. Uh, we fight over whether you have the right to control the software in your computer. So, you know, if you think about a simple task like reading a web page and you say, what are all the things you have to do before you can look at a web page where step one, and I'm not being ridiculous here, is buy a computer. From step one, you're making decisions about what parties you vested control in. Would I rather have Apple software or Microsoft software? And people say, well, when has one of these people ever screwed me over? Well, you know, you buy an iPad, you can't look at Flash, right? That's not a security problem. Well, maybe it is a security <laughs> problem, but uh, you vested control in somebody, and you said, okay, fine, whatever they say, that's what I have to put up with. So once you begin to think about it in terms of control, Oh, I say the magic word. Computer science thinks about layers. Political science talks about control and power and contending over power. So all of a sudden, you've got a language they can speak. So <laughs> if I can take the structure of the internet and turn it into a conversation about power and control, I can talk to them. That was beautiful. Five minutes would just boil down a you know, year and a half. <laughs> well, <laughs> the hindsight is 20. The beauty blah, of the cube, blah, blah. right? Well, <laughs> that's right. Well, are, are policymakers starting to make progress in understanding uh, this? Or are, are you making progress in applying this language so that in a way that policymakers can truly understand it? I think so. And the reason I say that is very simple. I wrote a paper with a bunch of slides and a bunch of people have come up to me and said, I'm teaching this class and I used your slides and my non-technical students can really <laughs> understand your slides. I got it, okay. So, so the answer is maybe we're educating people and, you know, and it's not just us, but, but yes, I think we're building ways of, 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 of a common vocabulary and that's, to me, that's just a big accomplishment. Well, that's certainly. Course, we have to bottle it, but. Right, that's, that's at least you know, step one, but uh, we've heard a lot in this conference about the need for a multilateral, multi-stakeholder multi approach to governance and security, where we've got a very US-centric uh, approach right now, if we, you could even call it an approach, because it's so kind of slip shot. But what do you think about that model? Does, does it need to be broadened to include other stakeholders beyond the US? Well, first of all, it has to be multi-stakeholder in the sense that it's not just governmental. Mm -hmm. Because so much of the internet is being defined by the private sector, it's being uh, shaped by private sector investment. You can't imagine a state organization getting a hold of this in an effective way. So the first thing these states collectively have to do is to figure out how to do multi-stakeholder because governments are pretty good at listening to other people provided they still think they're in charge at the end of the day. <laughs> if they actually don't think they're in charge, they don't know what to do. And, that, and, and so they tend to run away. And you know, I've actually had conversations with people in the government that said, why don't you engage the standards process? And well, they do to some extent, so I don't want to deprecate that. But I've actually had people say to me, if at the end of the day I'm not in charge, I don't know how to be in the room. I just, just viscerally don't know how to do it. So, so 
The, the second question is, how does the United States protect its interests and at the same time really help us go to a global internet? And that's troubling because there are countries who clearly have a vision of the internet that's not the one that our country would have, the one I particularly like. How respectful should we be of the sovereign laws of states where we don't actually like the consequence of the laws? Well, right, and, and getting stakeholders, the current stakeholders who have the control to cede some of that control in any endeavor is going to be a challenge. Oh, it's scary as hell for them. <laughs> right, by, by, by definition, right? Right. Um, and then when you've got not only other states, uh, entities to take, to, to take into consideration, you've got corporations, but then you've got non-state actors. Uh, you've got threats coming from, we've talked about Anonymous and other groups out there. Um, it's a pretty scary world, and if you've got that control now, you might be inclined to kind of uh, hold on to that as much as you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. But notice what, for example, the U.S. government is actually holding control over with respect to ICANN. It's the ability to cre create top-level <laughs> domain names, right? And uh, as, again, as I said, that's not where the action is. It's not where the excitement around the future is, nor is it where the excitement around malicious behavior is. So where do they need to focus their attention to? Well, by the way, they are focusing a lot of their attention on cybercrime. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean to imply there's nothing going on there. There's a lot of attention, in fact, multinational attention uh, to cybercrime. I think that there's one of the forks in the road really has to do with the division between things that look like issues of national interest. Espionage is the ongoing one, and sort of what I call fear of low probability events, like major destruction of physical infrastructure or something. But I think the future of the internet is going to be shaped as much by whether the individual citizen, the individual user, has a sense of confidence about the environment. Are they, can they tell when they're going to a bad cyber neighborhood? Do they know when to be cautious? Uh, what do they understand really about identity theft, fraud, uh, something horrible happening to them? All my wedding pictures being deleted. I bet you most people today have all their pictures online, right? I bet you most people don't know how to do backup. You know, imagine a horrible event in which 100 million people all of a sudden do that, discover that all of their pictures have been magically encrypted and they have to pay $100 to get them back. Um, but that's not national security but it really is going to affect the future of the internet and what people can use it for. Because if people get nervous, people draw back, then in fact we're losing a lot of the potential, and I think it's the transformative potential of the internet. So I think we need to clean up a lot of the mess that the individual is facing. And you know, if I can just elaborate a little bit more in that space, when, when people say to me, I want a more secure internet, they're not technologists. so. They're not making the distinction I do. To me, the internet is a thing that hauls packets around. And the stuff on top, which is the exciting stuff, is called applications. Mm -hmm. And they say, I want a more secure internet. What they're actually talking about is the whole ball of wax rolled up because they don't say layer. Right. <laughs> and okay. the trouble is, as internet architects, I'm not in charge of the applications. If you want to build the world's sloppiest application that is absolutely full of holes, like Swiss cheese, as far as security is concerned, I can't keep you from doing it nor can I police you at the packet level because I can't even see what's in the packets. So if Facebook is really secure or Facebook is insecure, I have no control over that. But people come to us and say, why don't you make the internet more secure? And the answer is that's saying, why don't you build me a highway that can do anything you want, but would you please stop getaway cars? And the answer is no, it doesn't work. Generali one of the consequences of generality is that it permits bad behavior. <laughs> and you just have to accept that. So we've got to move up. We've got to train application designers to create an internet experience which is safe or at least predictable. I'm sorry, some people like unsafe experiences. They need, they need to know that's what they're doing, right? You know, you know, if you want to go bungee jumping, that's fine. But you know you're about to right. jump so off. So it's about something. educating people so they at least understand the rules of the road and, and, what, and identify when there are potential risks. And it has to be done in terms they can understand. Right. Yeah. David, you said off-camera security is not <clears throat> monolithic, okay, and we know that uh, risk by its very nature is, is distributed. Uh, Mark Hopkins, uh, our managing editor, talks about reducing system complexity, reducing it down to a protocol, for example. He covers Bitcoin a lot, and, and Bitcoin's right. been called 
the most cleverly concocted protocol since TCP IP, how, how ironic. So I, I wanted to ask you your thoughts on, and, and Bitcoin's decentralized. So I wanted to ask you your thoughts just on, on reducing complexity through a protocol. Amazon's turned the, the, the data center into a protocol. So what are your thoughts on, on that and its applicability to potentially solving the, the security challenge? I don't actually know that I have a coherent answer to that. I'll give you an answer, but I'm not sure it's coherent. Great. Okay. I'd be shocked if you had a coherent um, answer. But. The point is, <laughs> all things that we think of as specifiable or technically constrained very quickly end up embedded in a larger social ecosystem which, in some sense, defies the, the simplicity of the protocol. <laughs> right. right. That's and very so good. And <laughs> we, 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 we think we have a technical solution and then you just get out there in the real world and you run into this, well, actually you didn't, you know. Uh, and so, so I don't know that you can actually, I don't know how far you can push that idea before you run into this sort of contextual reality where you know the multiple constraints out there are economic, they have to do with investment, they have to do with incentive, and you know, even Bitcoin has run into some interesting uh, larger context issues. Indeed. <laughs> right. Not that, I'm not an expert on Bitcoin, but you know. No, but you're right. I mean, the uh, Chinese government's uh, basically signaling that it, you're not going to support it necessarily. Or, I mean, that, right. that you see the dips. And so there are a lot of headwinds, a lot of headwinds in, in this world. Now, you mentioned several. You know, economic, let's talk about the, the, the cyberspace and security and governance gap. What, what do you see as the big headwinds there that we have to attack? Well, a lot of the problems cannot be solved by one actor moving alone. If you have a problem that one person can solve and they have an incentive to solve it, by and large, they sort of get on with it's it. It's done. <laughs> but if you ask, well, what would it take to move us to a regime where all email is signed by default? Okay. Which I think would eliminate a lot of phishing. Right? And phishing, of course, is the vector through which a lot of very sophisticated attacks are delivered. And phishing is such a stupid attack, but it works. Okay. Well, okay, so signed email. Well, the first thing is we got two competing technical solutions, okay? We've got SMIME and we got PGP. And as long as nobody actually thinks they're gonna deploy anything, those guys will continue fighting with each other because it's fun to fight. And certainly if you're an academic, you're not paid to agree with somebody, right? You know, I can't get a grant from the NSF by saying, I think his work is great. <laughs> I get a grant from the NSF by saying, well, I'm gonna improve on his work. I have an alternative, okay? So I once counted up how many addressing schemes, I mean, internet has an addressing scheme in it, you know, the IP address 32 bits. I went through, it through the literature and I counted up how many papers I could find that had been published in a conference which had an alternative naming and addressing scheme, and I think I stopped at 32. That's 32 grants, that's 32. Now, if somebody had come to us, Manhattan Project style, and said, no, I'm gonna pay you to agree, we can agree. We know it can be done, okay. It's gotta be some good, Good, act, good, good right. activity within those 32. That's right. right? <laughs> but so, you know, the problem with, with trying to get signed email is first you have to take these guys who are busy fighting over SMIME versus PGP and say, okay, guys, it's time to have a conversation where I'm going to reward you, I'm going to incentivize you to see if we can agree. Can we harmonize? Can we come to a compromise? Then you have to get out there and solve the first mover problems. You have to modify the email software, the server software, human behavior, and multiple actors have to participate in doing that. And so I would say, well, why should I modify my email reader when if I modify my email reader, you can't read my email? So there's this horrible coordination problem. And, uh, and that's why things go very slowly. If it's a simple problem that belongs to one person, it can get solved. But that's why I said words like leadership and governance, governance defined very broadly. I don't mean governments. I mean organizations that say, look, I have competence in standing. Let me suggest that there's a common direction. Why don't we go that way? Okay. And, you know, I like to remind people that if you're lost in the woods, there's sometimes more than way, one way out. You can go north and get out. You can go south and get out. But going in circles never works. <laughs> and so we've got to pick a direction and say, let's go. You know, and there will always be people who are unhappy. Is it, uh, do you think we need a major event to, to focus people's attention? Oh, I hate it when you say need. <laughs> you know, <laughs> would that help? I understand what in, you're in saying. An in, in, a, in a strange kind of way. Obviously, so, we don't want to see a tragedy. But well, so the problem is, if you look at 9/11, which of course was a horrible tragedy with real 
you know, both human life and, and horrible consequences, you, you sort of quantum tunnel from not paying enough attention to paying too much. <laughs> right. And so my view is there will be an event. I don't know what it is. And part of what we should be doing is having conversations in the background so that when there is an event and all of a sudden everybody wakes up and says, oh my God, what are we going to do? You have an answer. You say, well, <laughs> you know, here's an answer. It would be nice if we had it up our sleeve. Those things have short half-lives, you know, six months, a year later. So you, you got to be ready to seize that moment. So do we need it? I understand what you're asking. Do I want it? No. Should we be prepared to recognize that it might happen? Yes. Um, <laughs> But we should think about it in the larger social context. You remember Metcalf used to run around and say the internet was going to collapse you know, by the end of Did, next year. Didn't he eat a hat at one point? Yeah, he ate a hat. I was working with him at the time at IDG. Is he, is he more likely to be you know, correct today or back then? Well, you know, honestly, I don't know what he said recently, so I have to punt on that one. I actually don't oh, no, no. I mean, the internet collapsed. If you made that uh, you know, prediction today, would you be more correct today? Or no, I don't, think so. so I don't think so. But, but let's explain what is actually happening. As I said, the internet experience is defined by the applications. And what we are seeing today is a divergence in the experience that people choose to have. Now, when a country like China constrains the experience, they say, no, if you want to use Facebook, you can't. I, I think I, 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 I resist that. I resent that. I, but if you turned on Facebook in China, how many people would move to China move to Facebook as opposed to the indigenous product that they have there, which has been nicely localized. And it, you know, it may very well be that they're having a very effective domestic internet experience, which is not ours. And if the internet is truly meant to be a general platform, then can I complain when I don't use Twitter and you do? Gasp, I don't use Twitter. Uh, so, you know, you, I, do. I, don't, I don't think you have a complaint if I don't That's use no Twitter. <laughs> so, so the point is we already see... I'm envious. Yeah, <laughs> we, we see a divergence of experience, and if that's collapsed, then that's going to happen. As more and more people come on, they're going to seek experiences that are more localized, that are tailored to their language, that are tailored to their culture. Uh, I, I'll tell you my image. It's entirely different than collapse. Um, if you think about some of the financial bubbles we've had, starting with tulips and railroads and internet, and you ask people to actually study these bubbles, there's this period of exuberance, there's this period of collapse, and then afterwards, there's actually a growth at a re perfectly reasonable slope. And I think we've had not a financial exuberance here, although we did with the dot-com and the dot-bomb, but we've actually had what I might call an exuberance of cosmopolitanism, <laughs> where everybody said, oh, this is going to be a great global platform, and everybody will do the same thing. And then, you know, and <laughs> But I think right now we're seeing ongoing steady social change inside China, among other things. Mm. And what we should do is understand that, that rates of change that run too fast scare people. And so we should actually be accepting of reasonable rates of change. How fast can things change in, in countries where we're really shaking up the culture with the internet? You're absolutely, that's a great point. And oftentimes, though, the initial expectations are vastly exceeded <laughs> at post-bubble. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, at, yeah, so, so. I, 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 I'm not saying I'm... The maybe not with tulips, but certainly with, <laughs> with the internet. And yeah, right. Maybe not with Bitcoin. We will see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll see about Bitcoin. That's right. But I think we're, we're sort of coming out of that period of dashed hopes. And, but we're actually on a slope where what is happening is more reasonable, is more stable. And we should actually look at this as, as the real vector of change. And, and compared to social time constants, it's actually going pretty fast. All right, David, we got to let you go because uh, I want to make sure that you get to your panel in plenty of time. I can see why they held you to the end. You're a good draw uh, for, the, for the audience. <laughs> so thanks very much for coming on theCUBE and, and sharing your ideas and, and really appreciate it. Well, your and thank you for having time. me. It's a lot of fun to talk. All right, take care. Good enough. Okay, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back to wrap. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly. We're live at MIT in Cambridge. Right back. Okay.